in my previous video, I alluded to the phenomenon of doing puja. Uh, that's doing a small act of de ceremonial devotion, although they can be huge as well. You can have uh, puja involving thousands of people. But in the normal scheme of things, puja is simply a little act of devotion that one does, say, with a little image of a god, a murti, um, which could consist of offering said deity or said murti, uh, incense, fruit, uh, flowers, this kind of thing. Um, that's the phenomenon of bhakti, which is ceremonial devotion to a Hindu god, one's chosen god. Uh, I didn't allude to this at all in my original series because it's it's very similar in many ways to Western theism. Uh, it's also the most common form of worship in Hinduism, where you know you often see in India gatherings of people who have gotten together. They sometimes sit in a circle, uh, they chant or they sing, and they they beat their little cymbals. Somebody might make some noise with a drum or just beating on a little uh, empty uh, can or something like this, and they chant. Um, if you've ever seen the Hare Krishnas going at it, you'll get the idea. Now, to a Westerner, and even to many Indians, to be honest, um, this is looked upon as pretty non-intellectual stuff. The point is to love God. Okay, now, remember, the main issue here is to love God. Obeying God, yes, but the main thing is love God. O believe in God, yes, but before belief is love. Love is necessary. Bhakti comes from the word Bhagavad, Bhagwan, which is basically the sharing out of the good goodies of this life. It has a very pleasant uh, sound to it, a very, in, to the Indian ear, Bhakti is something nice. You're just reminding yourself through a little ritual that you love God. You love God with all your heart and soul, and the main thing is, is to bring this fount of love within yourself to the surface. This kind of Hinduism has never really appealed to me. Um, I'll be perfectly honest, I often inwardly chant mantras when I am meditating. Um, uh, but I'm just as likely to inwardly chant, as I said, rhyming Irish poetry. Um, <clears throat> and one of the interesting parts of bhakti is, if you, there, there actually is an intellectual justification for it, um, believe it or not, even though it does look fairly simplistic. And it often is very simplistic. Um, let's say, me as a non-Hindu, I go to a Indian store. There's stores in my city that sell little images of Hindu gods. I purchase one of these images. I make a little altar in my living room. And every day at, I don't know, when I get up or before I go to bed, I sit there for half an hour and I chant mantras before this little image of the god. And say I burn incense or I, you know, ding, ding, ding the little symbols or whatever. <laughs> Strictly speaking, I don't even have to believe that that god is real to be uh, engaged in bhakti. A lot of Hindus would disagree with this, but a lot of Hindus would agree. They would say, look, it doesn't really matter whether or not you believe in the existence of this god. That's not really the point. The point is, is to bring forth this enormous font of love inside of us that is waiting in there to come out. Um, or that is it is in there if we care to tap it. Um, if you've ever engaged in mantra meditation, say, which is kind of bhakti-ish, because um, they're often um, you're chanting the name of a god or the god's as uh, aspects or whatever. Um, Om Nam Shivaya, Om Nam Shivaya, Hare Hare Bole, Nama Shivaya, or Hare Krishna, or whatever. Sounds like you're reciting the rosary, and it is very similar to that. But you don't 
strictly speaking, according to the more intellectual apologists for bhakti, have to believe any of it. Love is the main thing here that you're looking for. And love is best or most easily awakened when you have something to love. <laughs> I mentioned to Mystica the Sands in the previous video that Nietzsche um, refers to the phenomenon of amor fati. To me, that's one of his most liberating, if you ask me, um, ideas, where you love your fate, you love your future. You, <clears throat> you don't even have to like it. You can love your future. You can like something, um, or rather you can love something without actually liking it, um, believe it or not, <laughs> if you choose to do so. If you've ever been in a love-hate relationship with another human being, you know how that works. Um, and you can love something that you know does not even exist. Ask a teenaged girl about um, Crawfee in The Catcher in the Rye. How many teenage girls have fallen in love with him? He's a fictional character. He doesn't exist, and the people who read the book know he doesn't exist. The point is to concentrate your mind in such a way that love comes forth. And I would call it something along the lines of amor fati, but it's almost a love of the universe, and God is the personification of the universe. The universe, if anything exists, the universe exists. If you love the universe, then in many ways you are engaging in bhakti. This is the somewhat intellectual justification for all the simplistic stuff that you see in Hinduism with the funny multi-armed gods and the singing and the endless mythological stories and all this kind of thing. I'm sure that for 90% or more of Hindus who engage in this, all these gods actually did exist. They did do all the things that they that are ascribed to them in the various Puranas and the, the stories and the Mahabharata and the uh, Ramayana. I'm sure that most people actually believe it. But if you've ever been to, <clears throat> say, a lecture from a well-known, um, say, Swami or just a Hindu teacher who is not so much initiating you into an idea, but you're discussing a profound idea, uh, such as, you know, something intellectual, like... Um, the Hindu view of identity or the Hindu concept of logic, you get together in a group and oftentimes the Swami, before he even starts talking about this extremely egghead stuff, he will enjoin you to join him in singing a little song praising, say, Lord Ganesh or Lord Shiva or something like this. So everybody gets together and, and the Westerners somewhat self-consciously sing along with it and you know, okay, now can we get to the real stuff? Why would even a guy like that um, insist upon this kind of thing? Or I shouldn't say insist, but encourage this kind of thing. Before we start talking about the real stuff, let's dip our feet a little bit into this warm pool of love. Why? This is not the logical, rational, or, you know... Um, egghead type of Hinduism that I, or Vedanta or whatever that I came here to discuss, but he still will say, sing with me, then we will, then you will hear what I have to say about the origins of the universe or, um, <clears throat> the nature of fate or, uh, or uh, the nature of time, things like this. Uh, the lines are blurred in Hinduism in India in general. And again, I'm not talking about 90% of popular folk Hinduism here. I'm talking about the more rarefied levels. Bhakti is, in many ways, inextricable from the rest of Hinduism. But it has its um, intellectual apologists. And they make an intelligent and coherent case, if you ask me. It's not for me, but I understand it. If you concentrate all of your mind, your energy, your thoughts and everything on how much you love this chosen God of yours, who in the Hindu view of things often is 
the universe? Is it just the simple, mindless idolatry, as it's described in the Old Testament? I don't think so.